Hello and welcome to another episode of Political Agenda brought to you by New Narrative, a movement for democracy in Southeast Asia. My name is PJ Thumb. I'm your host and I'm wearing a red and black batik shirt and I'm sitting in front of a bookcase full of books. My pronouns are he, him. This podcast is brought to you by New Narrative, a movement for democracy in Southeast Asia, and we need you, we need your support to continue to thrive. So if you'd like to join New Narrative, please go to newnarrative.com slash join to join or newnarrative.com slash donate to donate. Today, we have legendary Singaporean civil society activist Connie Singham, who is here to talk about her memoir, her new book, which is called Where I Was, a memoir about forgetting and remembering. Welcome to the show, Connie. Thank you very much, PJ. Thank you for having me. Yes, um, the, you, you, it, it's not a new book, you know. Oh, no, it's not? That's being republished and, and brought up to date. It was oh, a book okay. that I first wrote about 10, 10 years ago, a couple of years after the Away Saga. What have you updated with, with this book? Well, the last 10 years, uh, what's happened since and what I have been doing since the book was published, because much has happened in terms of public policies and, and regulations and legislation. And, um, and also, uh, we wanted to update it. I mean, Ethos has done a marvelous job, make it more readable to young Singaporeans. Because one of the things that I noticed was people who have, young people who have read my, the first edition, was amazed at the history they didn't know. Yes. And that was history that was part of my life, like the Marxist conspiracy, for instance. They didn't know that. And I think it's important that people be reminded of history because you know where you are and what you are and the kind of citizen you are from history. So yeah, that well, you important. don't need to tell me that, Connie. I yes, mean, I know you're a historian. Uh, so yes, yeah. yes. But what, you know, what always bothers me is just like, I've published so much and yet people don't read it, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. And so I'm trying to get my work out in more accessible ways. And I think what you're doing is fantastic because we don't have enough, um, you know, uh, memoirs from the, from the people who took such a active role in shaping our country, especially post-independence, yeah. right? And I think for activists, it's there's you, there's Wampiao, there's So Lang. Are there any other sort of non-PAP, non-governmental activists? That, that is a bit of a worry. I think there are. There are some coming out, like uh, Mr. Raman. G. Raman has published his. Oh right, yes. Why, yes, uh, yeah. and uh, that is why I. My first impulse was that that there are lots of PAP books, and that's one perspective of what our country is, but you need to also have people, ordinary people, they need not be activists to write a different perspective, lived experience of Singapore from the ordinary citizen, you know? And, um, and that was important to me. Again, you talk about history, history, you have many perspectives. And so we were only getting one perspective and we need to get a variety. And that's what prompted me to write that. Uh, Besides from wanting to get over the saga, yeah. Right. Even <laughs> after all these years, does it still really bother you? No, no, I think it has stopped bothering me. I try not to because my, my life has moved on. And uh, um, no, it doesn't. Sometimes, yeah. But most of the time, I'm, I'm fine, actually. It's right. doing very well. Away is doing very well. Maybe we needed that kick in our butts to, to get over the level of apathy. And mm -hmm. I think Singapore needs a kick in the butt to <laughs> get over. I, I think we're getting, we're getting that. You look at the state <laughs> of the country right now, it's quite scary. But yeah. let's start with the Aware Saga. You know, it's the sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you, you open and you close the book with this saga and it's very clear it's it's a hugely formative experience and a traumatic experience and you know i think speaking as someone from the outside for me it was it was uh, a big shock when it happened i was follow i was in oxford at the time yeah. and i was taking a group of international students 
um, on a tour of, of, the, of Oxford and we had actually ended up um, at Blenheim Palace watching a, a sort of a mock jousting display of all things, right? Mm. And so they were like, you know, watching this jousting happening, going, wow, look at that. And meanwhile, myself and my then girlfriend, we were huddled over at the side, like watching the tweets, the, you know, yes. people updating what was going on. Yes. And when, yes. when you all won, we were so excited and we were jumping around. Yes. And it was all the way in the UK on the other side of the world. I but what, what is your strongest memory of it? I, I heard that was the, the most widely tweeted and listened to at that time, at that moment, you know. What is my, of course, my memory is the day we were thrown out when, uh, when they walked in and uh, I was the president then and, uh, and uh, it was all very constitutionally done, you know, I mean, they, they had the membership and, but the shock was that it didn't plan as we had planned and uh, that there were a whole lot of strangers who knew nothing about AWARE was taking over AWARE. Of course, it doesn't strike how serious or how fundamental that challenge was till a few days later. Then you begin to think, what, who are these people? What are their motives? What are their values? You know, although quite a number of our members questioned their values for which we received no answer. It takes a few days and a few weeks because the very next day I was sitting there and thinking, Good heavens, what has happened? What did just happen? You know, and uh, I remember ringing up a few people, aware people, and saying, I think we've been taken over. And they said, Who wants to take over where? Yeah. You know? <laughs> that was the response. Who indeed? And of course, we found out who did take over where. And so the next few weeks, and I was part of that because I was, uh, there is, there is a place in the Exco for, past presidents and it became very painful because the value system was so different. It so was, you were like uh, sitting there in subsequent meetings and yeah. then just listening to them and was well, there fighting them, challenging them and telling them this is our value system, this is our precedence, this is how we work, you know, this is an NGO, a civil society, not a company and um, so yeah, so challenging them all the time, you know, so that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. You know, we had to get rid of them. Was there something Before anyone survive. said? Like, do you remember someone saying something and you, you know, at that moment you knew, oh my God, this is, this is, you know, they've crossed the line. This is yeah. totally... Well, over the top because one of the things that they came, all the practices we we held very sacred as an ngo democratic practices that we held they were throwing out you know mm -hmm. and and it was interesting because uh, every statement they would refer to the constitution to the aware constitution so they followed what they were literal they were literal mm -hmm. in the interpretation of the constitution, you know? So they were throwing out, for instance, I mean, aware uh, continues the work from one president to another president, you know, especially the committee works and especially CEDAW, for instance, because it takes a few years set in motion a CEDAW report. And so the committee had been working on it for a few years and they sacked the chair and the whole committee. Bremer, right? Bremer was yeah, chair. Yeah. yeah, and that that in itself was, I told them, that's not what we do, you know, we respect the work they do, and the work has co to continue, but they did. So those are, those are some of the things. And then what was even more shocking, I mean, it's an NGO, it's a women's organization, and you welcome everybody, and it has to be open, because people who need help has to be able to walk into AWARE and seek help but they locked the doors and wow. they, yeah, they locked the doors and you needed a card to enter. And that in itself, I mean, that is a physical symbol of the whole value system they were promoting. It was closed. It was closed, you know, wow. and we were an open, open uh, organization. So that, that, 
for me, that was the saddest part. You know, you, uh, you can't walk in anymore. People in trouble can't walk in. I yeah. See. So reading your account of it, right, what really struck me was that it sounded very much like how the PAP itself was taken over by Lee Kuan Yew and Ho Chin Chai and their maneuvers. And really, you think about how they approached it. They tried to operate like the PAP, aggressive, you know, very legalistic, very bullying. And they assumed it would work because they assumed that people shared the values of the PAP. They had really bought into this narrative, oh, we're a conservative country. People don't actually want, you know, quote unquote, liberal values. They don't want, quote unquote, Western values, actually, you know. And and so these very conservative Christians had come in thinking that the PAP succeeds because people actually genuinely buy into how they operate and what they do when actually the PAP succeeds because it has a monopoly of violence in Singapore, right? It has, it has control of the security services, it can control the administration, it can make our lives miserable if we don't cooperate. And I think if, you know, it, it, then the flip side is it suggests that you take away the PAP's ability to destroy our lives and we would all just ignore them as we did with this group of women who came in trying to operate like the PAP and found very quickly that, no, most Singaporeans don't agree with them. And I think you wrote in your book, they seem very shocked that they would get thrown out so quickly. Yeah. Yes, but, you know, I have... Uh, well, firstly, uh, the, the, the Christian church and all organized religions, I think, are patriarchal and authoritarian. Yeah, so that's where they come from. Uh, that's their value system, and that's that's their conditioning, um, and uh, that's one thing. And uh, the next is I, and this is a speculation. I think people were just fed up about living in an authoritarian uh, society, mm. and they feel helpless. And here is a chance. Here is a chance for them to to do something about it. Here we have the opportunity to show that we don't like this way of running things. And so a lot of them would not have been an aware supporter or even aware member. They became aware members on that day. And, but they didn't like the values under which this group operated. And um, that, that is the problem. And that I think was what motivated people. We, can't, we won't stand for it. And here we can do something about it. As you said in your book, you know, it really gives, um, it really shows the lie that Singaporeans are apathetic, right? It's not that we're apathetic. It's not that we're not political. It's not that we don't want to take part in these, you know, in political events and speak up. It's that we're afraid. Fundamentally, we're afraid of the PAP and the PAP, because the PAP can destroy all our lives. And, in, in, and then because we choose to self-censor out of fear, the PAP then says, oh, hey, look, people are apathetic. They don't care. You know, they want a firm hand to lead them. But you give people the opportunity. So it's a point I've, I've made many times, right? You look at aware, but you look at, say, any uh, school, right? The parents of any, um, you know, parents of school children and how aggressively political they are lobbying for their kids. You look at any condo, residence committee and Singaporeans are so aggressive or any sports club, right? Our sports clubs, in my experience as an athlete, are incredibly political. So Singaporeans, we actually no, 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 are very political. Jump in, jump in at that. You know, I think people are aggressive because people are disempowered. Yeah. They feel powerless, which is why that aggression comes forward. And I, I see that in... Um, social media responses, you know, um, that's the only way they know how to act, you know, because reason doesn't get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we are not, a, well, you know, we've been conditioned. We have lived in this, in this um, political system for over 50 years now, and we have been conditioned to act the way we act. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the PAP, the, our leaders, our political leaders, they're bullies, right? They use the, the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. They try yeah, and yeah. they act very aggressively. Yeah. And then, you know, then they also take no prisoners, very zero sum, right? No compromise. And then they're surprised when Singaporeans behave that way. They're like, yeah. why can't Singaporeans compromise and be reasonable? Well, because our leaders have built a system in which the only way to succeed is by not compromising and not being reasonable and being very aggressive and hostile. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's that's the government we got, you know, when we became an independent nation. So we haven't experienced anything different. Um, and an alternative value system that we have been uh, silenced into behaving the way we have. And uh, PAP's only, only response to any kind of challenge is to have more le legislation which mm. limits you or restricts you even more. To the point that you made earlier about that we are not an apathetic, we are. We have been conditioned to be apathetic. And uh, so? we have. Mm. No, I, I think the vast majority, like the 2011 election, for instance, if you look at that, and all the problems that gave rise to people coming forward, all the rallies in Honglin Park, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, all the protests, and that was because people were feeling that unless we do something about it, the government is going to go on and have 10 million mm -hmm. population. And we needed, we needed to uh, put a stop to, we needed to challenge that. So aren't you contradicting yourself there? Because you said people are apathetic, but then they so. rose up and voted the government. If, if it touches them personally, again. they would. They would, you know, if you touch them, they look, PAP still won by 60 odd percentage of the votes. Well, yeah, it wasn't a fair election. It wasn't a free and fair election, as I've said many times and explained why. And the PAP have not denied, right? It's, yeah. The elections yeah, aren't sure. free and fair. But most of the time, Singaporeans just settle back. They worry about their bread and butter issues. Mm -hmm. And um, and they worried about the butter. See what happened the following election, you know? And uh, well, the, the following election was a bit of a freak election because, you know, yeah. Lee Kuan Yew, SG50, I, yeah. and then a huge amount of money taken out of our reserves and thrown at the, at you know, Pioneer Generation, Medeca Generation, which, which you... Well, you, you know, you're part of I the... benefited from that. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that. But I also think that happened because of the 2011. Oh, election. definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, which is my point about active citizenry. Mm -hmm. You know, that so far, whether it's from NGOs or civil society activism, we have seen changes as a result of advocacy work. So okay. again, you're saying I'm contradicting myself. Yes, I'm contradicting myself because there is there is a part of the population who are apathetic or who have no power. Mm -hmm. They are disempowered, you know, because I I can't remember what the current statistics is that there's so much poverty in Singapore. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, the government's own numbers. You know, yeah. are twenty percent. If you That's look at independent yeah, numbers, yeah. like oh, like Lam Kyung study, thirty thirty five percent. Yes, yeah. a lot of poverty. Yeah. Poverty, and they don't. They can't worry about politics. They worry about where the next meal is coming from. You know. Yeah, but fundamentally, that, that it's not a choice. Then, right? You you know, apathy implies you choose not to be involved, but. If it's not a choice because you're poor or afraid, which I think most Singaporeans are afraid of the government. I know I'm afraid, you know, and so you I, in your yes. book, you talked about fear. Yeah. Right. So it's not a choice. It's you can only say people are apathetic if they have a genuine choice whether to participate or not. But we don't. So I think I understand your point you're making. Most people don't take part, but I wouldn't call it apathy because I think it's not a choice that people have. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well okay we we want to um we'll, we'll get back to this right because i want to talk uh, about you and your story but before we do that um 
like one last question about the aware saga i think is do you feel you implied that you kind of won the battle but lost the war because it scared the government into taking uh sex education aware sex education out of schools and you know i think there's also criticisms today that aware has become too cozy with the government to making too many compromises you mentioned in 2008 you went to a sioni uh, talk and they were very unhappy because they felt aware did nothing for lesbians. Um, so, how do you feel looking back now? Is aware still adhering to the values in which it was founded, which was very much trying to promote the rights of women in opposition to very eugenicist and, and elitist government policies that were coming out in the 80s? Or has aware become sort of comfortable in its middle age and you know settled into a certain role in Singapore where it's part of the establishment or something else? I can't speak for aware because right. I'm not actively involved in aware. Right. But when I was president and any any uh, civil society organization will, will tell you that the constitution of the organization is controlled by the register of societies mm -hmm. and there are always limitations to what you can do and how you can do and that is held over every time it comes up every time your charity status comes up you know if you don't follow then that status is taken away from you and that is very difficult for any kind any organization because you depend on uh, on funding from companies and from individuals who can then claim tax exemption right yeah. so that's one way they can manage or control you but if you look at aware something else this this is not a new criticism of aware you know hmm. i had to fight it for from the moment, say 10 years on from AWARE's founding, people were criticizing us all the time that you have become too cozy with the government, you have become part of the establishment. And I always say that this is the nature of organizations. Once you become established, people criticize you. But AWARE work worked really hard to get where AWARE is now. And if you look at all the accomplishments, it is hard work and advocacy work and research work that's forcing the government to listen to aware. Sexual harassment, for instance, violence mm. against women, for instance, single uh, problems of single women, for instance, single mothers, all that had been worked hard and addressed by aware over the years, but it took 20 years I mean, violence against women, we started it then, you know, 35 years ago. Sexual yeah. harassment is the same thing. Yeah. And all these, it's only after 30 years, we are seeing, or 20 years, we started seeing some kind of result. And just because we are seeing results and there are policy changes, people look and say, oh, they're becoming too cozy with the government. That's not true. It's our hard work and advocacy work that has brought us where we are, where I, I'm not speaking on behalf of AWARE, but what AWARE has achieved, mm. you know? And you see, and because it's established, because it is still very public, yeah, people look at you and said, oh, you're very friendly with the government. Sometimes you have to work with the government to change policies, mm. you know, but right. that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you compromise your values. And I think that you're partly a victim of your own success, right? Because AWARE has been very successful. If you look at uh, your book and the, the quotes you include in it, I think it was Richard Hu in the 90s talking about how it's the, the yes, right. you know, the responsibility of men to take care of, of, of their wives. Mm. Right. And that's what, 93? Was it 95? Something like that. No, you know, so earlier, it, earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So not that long ago, within one no. generation, yeah. you've actually yeah. helped shift a lot. Yes. And so I guess expectations have changed where a statement like that would have been would be unthinkable today, where mm -hmm. the government is publicly committed to 
and recognizes sexual harassment and violence against women, even if they don't do as much as you know we would like. So yeah. I mean, we are now open society in some ways. I mean, in, in terms of global politics and global news, you know, and um, what is happening elsewhere. I mean, Singapore would be very embarrassed if they still talk themselves as a, even if they believe in it, even if some of the structures are as in patriarchy, they will mm. not stand up and say we are a patriarchal society, you mm. know? Yeah. And yeah, they will not. So Especially when the societies around us are so much more advanced socially yeah. Um. In terms of you know how uh not just culturally but mm -hmm. politically, you look at the countries that we used to cite. You know, we're saying we're Asian. Well, you know, many of the richest countries in Asia are way more liberal than Singapore. So what are you now? What what is you know what happened to this Asian values discourse? Right? Why can't we be more open like like South Asian Korea or Japan or Taiwan? Asian values discussion was a just a convenient discussion, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. It's convenient at that point in time to talk about Asian values. Yeah. So would you like to address then the other point I was asking about the Sione and the accusation that where doesn't do enough for LGBTQ women? When I look back at the history of uh, feminist movement elsewhere in the world, most of the movement, they didn't they were all part of the wider umbrella, but you had the you had separate organization addressing separate issues, you know, mm. uh, and uh, because of legal issues in Singapore, Sione has not been able to register itself. Yeah, you know, and which is why they were upset that Aware was not. The problem in Singapore with Aware is. Nobody else is doing any work on feminist issues. Aware is burdened with all the issues that confront women. Elsewhere, you have separate organizations dealing with separate issues, you know? And you will have many organizations. Here, we only have Aware. So Aware right. has to deal with, you know, we, we, when we first started uh, the campaign, to stop violence against women, we set up a separate organization because it was a huge issue. And the leadership of that organization failed to bring advocacy into, into public. It failed anyway. And, and to be specific, you're saying AWARE is the only like legally recognized organization because like Sione it's the and others. organization. But I mean, yeah, like, yeah. So, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They are unrecognized. Now, of course, them. after the saga, and oh, we had to address these issues. You know, they mm -hmm. couldn't keep ignoring. Uh, Sion is still trying to register. Yeah. But now you have all these organizations. Uh, they're not registered organizations, but they are also getting involved and submitting uh, reports to CEDAW. Yes. So they are working. Sometimes I think you don't have to have a registered organizations to do the work. Well, I mean, the government denied new narrative our registration back in 2018. We're still <laughs> you know, here project. in Singapore doing the work. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. 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 So so I think we're about half an hour in. So let's uh, move on because I really want to talk to you about uh, what I see as the central theme of this book, which is identity. Yeah. Right. And um, I think because it comes right at the end, it suggests maybe that's a new addition uh, to the to the book um, where you talk, describe yourself as the Indian, the Singapore Indian, the wife, the widow, the feminist, the Catholic, the woman I had been and the woman I am now. And I think what's really interesting is your your life actually shows the fluidity of identity and how it's shaped by culture, history, time and place. Yeah, geography geography yeah and you know when you were born and this is something i think people uh struggle to to comprehend right it's the, the the fluidity of borders over time when you were born india and singapore were the same political unit yes right you could go yeah. from india to singapore it was just part of yeah. the empire you move back and forth there was mm -hmm. no distinction and then over time those borders have changed and shrunk 
right? India obviously became independent. And then, you know, you had Bangladesh and Pakistan. We shrunk down to Malaya, expanded mm-hmm. to Malaysia, shrunk down to Singapore. Mm-hmm. And, but the, the thing is, looking back, India and Singapore have, were the same political unit for longer than they have been separate political units since. Yeah, Malaysia. Likewise, Malaya, too. yes. Yeah. Mm. And there's no guarantee that Singapore's borders won't change. And there's no reason why we shouldn't try and change those borders for the better, right? To, you know, um, the, that country borders can be shaped and reshaped for the better. But, um, but you know, what I wanted to, 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 to say was like, your, your life really shows in just the space of one life how identity can be so transformed, you know, and how it shows identity adapts and shifts and changes over time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but it's not conscious, right? You don't feel like... No. I yeah. mean, when I wrote my, my uh, impulse to write the chili book, you know, Don't Leave Home Without Your Chili, Chili Sauce, was to show in one way how food, and it's unintentional again, you know, how over the 50 years we have changed, our taste buds have changed and people Mm. haven't noticed it. And yet you talk about pure Chinese uh, food and pure Mm. Malay food and pure, there's no no such thing as pure anything anymore, Mm. you know, because we're all influenced by, I mean, the Panakan value system and, uh, and the, and food, for instance, over the 500 years have developed because they live in this region and they have adapt, adapted to this region, you know, and language mm. and culture and identity and was shaped by the region that they lived in and by the people they were interacting with, you know, and we have to look at it. So I get very, very upset when people say I am Chinese, I am Indian, you know, what is Indian and what is, I mean, they are culturally. What, They're what very is, fluid, right? Culturally, not, like, and both, it's, both it's Chinese and Indian. It's very political. You yes. are Chinese because I am identifying you as Chinese. And yeah. your government has identified you as Chinese. Yeah. And there is, a, there is an instance of a friend who was talking to me. He was Indonesian. In most countries, you are a nationalist. You're not a racist race. He's yeah. Indonesian. He's always thought of himself as Indonesian. He never thought of, he must be, uh, never thought of himself in terms of race. Till he came to Singapore and he was applying for citizenship in Singapore. And so he went to the immigration and the immigration very helpfully, but was very helpful and said, he wanted you to fill up the race column. And he said, look, I don't have a race, you know, mm. I'm Indonesian. So he said, why don't you say Chinese and you will get your citizenship very quickly. And so he <laughs> has become a Chinese in Singapore. <laughs> This man who has never thought of himself as Chinese is now marked as Chinese in his identity card and in his passport. Yeah. And, you know, it's political, you know, extremely the Mm. the term Chinese, like our conception of Chinese is a creation of the Chinese encounter with the West, right? In the, in the Qing dynasty. Yeah. And likewise, Indian, there was no such thing as Indian as we conceive it, it today cool. until the British came along and, and yeah. conquered the whole continent and created yeah. that idea. Yeah. You know? And the, the way that we have set up ideas of race in Singapore would also be very alien. You know, how we think of Chinese in, in Singapore would be, is very different from how people in China or Taiwan yeah. or Hong Kong yeah. think of Chinese. Yeah. Mm. And Likewise, how we think of Indian in Singapore is very different from how people in India think yeah. of Indian, right? It's, it's yeah. because it's all about political control. And this is a point I made in my videos that these racial categories were imposed by the British for convenience of administration, not because they're actually meant to reflect the identity on the ground yeah. or, you know, discern yeah. some sort of essential part of your yeah. society, your part of your spirit or whatever. No, it's just like, we just need it for admin because pe- there's so many people and we need to govern. So we need to categorize people to make it simpler. Yeah. And that's what the PAB does. Yeah. They have four categories yeah. of people and that makes it really easy. Mm. Four 
also, I mean, uh, I mean, the contradiction is Singapore wants to be a global city, wants to be an international city. At the same time, it wants to narrow the way people, Singaporeans think of themselves, you know, not as cosmopolitan, international, and which, which is a great way to be, you know, to mm -hmm. be open. Yeah. And to enrich our culture, to enrich. And I think if you didn't have uh, these controls and this uh, CMIO categories, people will be, if we haven't conditioned by those categories and have closed minds about racial categories, we wouldn't have the trouble we are having now mm -hmm. with new immigrants, you know? And uh, I think, and you know, way, it, this, um, this is really important. It's a really important point you're making because the government, by creating CMIO, legitimizes racism, right? It's saying it's okay to classify people based on race. It's okay to treat people based on race because they have different, right? They have Sinda and um, um, Mendaki, you know, and they treat people differently. You have to learn different languages. So, all of this sends the fundamental message that it's okay to treat people different based on race. And then the government's yeah. surprised. Oh, why are people racist? Because yeah. we have a racist system. We have a racist system and we have institutionalized that system. And even when we publicize the Malay separately from Indian separately, Chinese separately categories, we are creating a more racist society. The government does that. Yeah. you know yeah you know yeah. so anyway i mean it looks like that seems to be a real sacred cow not mm. going to be dismantled i don't think they have the courage or they know how uh, they don't know the, how i think yeah. the the world today is showing you know you you can't um a lot of how we think of the world in terms of race and nationalism isn't going to cut it because it can't solve global problems like the pandemic and climate crisis mm -hmm. and right now what we're struggling with is that um so much of how governments govern is about it is very much based on nation state nationalism and ethnic yep. you know racially based identities yep. and so much of their power and how they organize and how they administer and control people is based on these identities. Mm. And consequently, they can't solve problems which go beyond their borders and they can't get together because that goes fundamentally against the very nature of how they have structured and organized the yeah. whole worldview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I mean, in Singapore, it is not easy to govern a multicultural, multiracial society, especially since it's a young society. We don't have roots, fundamental roots, the kind of values we should be holding. Mm -hmm. You know, like Canada, for instance, even they are having problems, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not easy. I think there is a movement now and racism is at the uh, at the forefront of that, uh, and it has nothing to do with racism. It's got to do with uncertainties and uh, unhappiness mm -hmm. about all these dramatic changes that have happened in our lives. You know, people are yeah. feeling insecure, and I have so to disagree mm -hmm. slightly. With you know, when you say we don't have roots. The thing is, that was a conscious choice by the PAP. We did yes, have roots. We had yeah. Malayan roots, right? Yeah, we've been, yeah. you know, we like we've we've all our families have for most Singaporeans have been in Malaya for hundred years more, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, you know, Malays have been in the region. Um, well, yeah. uh, they're indigenous to the region. Um. But the PAP made a conscious choice to cut Singaporeans off from our local roots because of fear after 65 that Singaporeans would identify more with Malaysia than with Singapore. And so it was a, a, a you know, decade-long propaganda, two decades-long propaganda campaign to cut Singaporeans off from our roots and say, no, Singaporeans have no history. Our history starts now. We are the new man, new modern man, and we're going to create a new world. 
And then in the mid-80s, they found, oh, you know, we've created a whole generation of Singaporeans with absolutely no yeah. connection to their past and totally yeah. adrift and rootless. And we're yeah. seeing the consequences. So they create this whole connection to raffles and <laughs> like legitimize colonialism and suddenly say, oh, it's great to be a colonizer. <laughs> Yeah, colonize. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and rather than being Southeast Asian. Yes, yes. You know? Yes. And, yeah. Really cut off I from mean, that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I are people of my generation, I mean, like taking soon, for instance, his sense of Malaya and his sense of those roots. And he still speaks about that. And he he I, I think it's great to have more people speak about that. That's our part of our history. That's part of our values, you know? And, um, and it's just amazing we have lived. I think we have been the oldest multicultural, multiracial society. Was Canada later, wasn't it? Canada and Australia were much later. Um, well, 1840, I think, was Canada's the, the charter. Um, so they they come before us, but they're they're com more complicated because they're white settler colonies. Yeah. Um, although arguably Singapore is a Chinese settler colony, um, in that the majority of the po population are also not indigenous, like Canada, Australia. But that was much later. Yeah, I think it's it, so. It if depends on how back, you measure it, whether back, it's through legal yeah, if charters. Yeah, you go back to history. Yeah, the oldest history, you know, the form, uh, the formation or evo evolution of the Peranakan com community. Peranakans, right? I yes. mean, yeah, we've been here for even the Indians have been here for a long period. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, when you know, as you noted correctly in your book, when Raffles walked up the beach, um, there were already a thousand people here. Mm. A lot of uh, Malays, Chinese, and um, Indians. Mm. Um, and also the other thing that people forget was when Raffles walked up the beach, the Europeans had been trading and participating in Southeast Asia for hundreds of years before that, yeah, right? The conquest of Malacca was in the 1500s. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so none of that was, was, was new. Um, and, you know, we all have very long roots. But ultimately, you know, if I can come back to this issue of identity, you know, I think the only way the country can be run in a multicultural society is you say, okay, you're a citizen, you have a certain set of rights, and we treat every citizen the same, and we aggressively try and stamp out any discrimination between people on any basis. That's mm -hmm. really the only way I think it can be done. The moment mm -hmm. you say, oh, we'll treat this group differently or that group differently, yeah. then you're legitimizing yeah. discrimination, yeah. right? No matter how pragmatic or easy, you know, it, it, it is, it's got to be, you've got to take the hard route and say everyone is equal, should be treated equally. We keep repeating that we can't have an Indian prime minister. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the United States as an Indian vice president yeah. and... Uh, and I mean, uh, we had David Marshall. You helped elect him. You <laughs> voted, right? Precisely. Yeah. Yes. And, and you know, JBJ won an election in a very Chinese uh, constituency. Yes. And so you know, crazy. last election, Murali defeated Chi Sun Juan. You know, it's yeah. not. There's, there's nothing racial about it. People just recognize who is is they want to do the the job for them. Yeah. You know who they think is the best at giving getting them the you know what they need to what they want in power, to stay yeah. in power yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah sure yeah. and this comes back to something you wrote right identity cannot be imposed in a top-down manner and yeah. i think that is that is so true but how would we how do we negotiate identity in a multicultural society you know you've lived through so much of singapore and you've seen how we've gone from a very separate society right the furnival's plural society where everyone <laughs> lives you know, that really struck me, right? Because people always talk about, oh, things were better in the old days. But they were better because all the linguistic and ethnic groups live separate lives and only interacted in the marketplace, which was a very clear no, agora, we, we, you know. We, we, we lived, uh, I mean, we had Chinese neighbors and British neighbors and Eurasian neighbors. We, mm -hmm. I think the middle class lived um, multicultural lives. 
You know, right, but it, you know, you, your own book points out only seven percent of Singapore's middle class in the fifties. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So a yeah. very minority, but most Chinese would live in you know a kampung that was uh, on the outskirts the of the city, yeah. for example. Well, and the Malays had their enclaves, you yes, know. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. But one of the points that I'm making, and uh, I am appealing to people because we feel so divided because of the public policies, yeah. is to form your own community, which is why the civil society community is so important to me. And because where you can be truly multicultural and multiracial, nobody bothers whether you're Indian, whether you're old, whether uh, you, are, you, you are poor or rich. Nobody bothers about that. It's only the work that the value that connects you to each other, you know, and that's the way we have to form communities. And I think uh, it, those kind of communities grow and they are growing. And you asked, how can we change society? That's the way we change society. It's a slow work, you know? And um, like, for instance, it took away 35 years to change attitude from patriarchal to address women's issues and give women rights and so on and so on. So that way we will keep changing. So there must be civil society organizations and that hasn't come about yet, which is a pity, but Maybe that will be the last to come. Multicultural society about race, you know, uh, civil society organization, which will address these kind of issues. So that's what you meant earlier when you talked about the importance of civil society and active yeah. engaged yeah. citizenry. That's right. Yeah. And what would it look like to you? Like what uh, what would you like to see? Or how 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 you know how do people become active engaged citizenry? One of the things that uh, that touches me and I have experienced, and I haven't been active in a way for more than 10 years, and but I have been continued to be active in civil society, you know, um, how young people seek me out, young people who have not been involved in any of the organizations that I have in each, that I have been part of. But young people do come up to me, they want to talk to me. And I think there is a real need, there is a yearning mm -hmm. for communities to come together to understand each other. And young people are doing that, you know? And they, 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 may, uh, they, they voluntarily make connections with me, ask me how to go about setting up organizations or being part of civil society. Uh, and because we don't have that kind of civic education in schools, uh, we, those people who go to school and come out of school don't know what to do, don't know how to organize themselves, don't know how to be a good citizen, be an active citizen. And that's what civil society has to do, how to be an active citizen. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's so true. In schools, we're taught that being a good citizen is, is, is shutting up and listening to the government. Yeah. Yeah, And then if we try and organize in schools or after schools, the government either, you know, crushes your organization or co-ops it and bends yeah, it to its will. Even in university, you know, mm -hmm. even in university, I'm told that they can't organize themselves. You yeah, know? I mean, students yeah. for a safer in US, for example, you know, mm. they, they uh, are not a legal, like registered society mm -hmm. because they can't achieve the things they want to achieve yeah. by if they became a, such a society, at least that's my understanding, right? Which, which doesn't make sense. Like who doesn't want, you know, uh, students to be safe? Who doesn't want to end sexual harassment of women in the US? Yeah. And yet somehow they can't do that if they become a, a registered society. I and that's, that's a problem. But we, we also should recognize you don't need to be a registered society to create no, change. No, you don't. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. You can get groups, have discussions and raise awareness and educate yourself, you know, mm -hmm. that can happen. And uh, I think maybe it's happening. Mm. Mm. Exactly. I think uh, people don't realize it's a very simple process. Yeah. It's not an easy process, but it is a simple. And it's exactly what you described. Educate yourself, get people together in groups, have discussions, and then take collective action. That's it thousands yeah. of years of politics and that's all it boils down to that's right, right. Yes. Yeah. yes 
<laughs> yes, I have written a piece, it's in my blog, but I also give it to people, how to organize yourself. You oh, know? fantastic. And okay. it always begins with conversations around the, around the table. It always begins with a conversation. And that's we, what we have to do. You have to do, don't have to depend on your school or your university to do that. Mm. Okay, we'll, we'll put a, a link to it in the show notes uh, so people can go and read it. <laughs> yeah. But I guess we're almost out of time. So I guess uh, the last question I had was how you, uh, you quoted Havel, right? And he held <laughs> that a better political and economic model could not be designed and introduced like a car which is the opposite of how the PAP governed. The PAP's argument is, you know, the perfect society can be designed. We just have to come up with the right laws and regulations and incentive structures to create it. But yeah. you're saying, and by quoting him, you're saying only by creating a better life can a better system be developed. Yeah. So my last question for you is, what is a better life for Singaporeans or Malayans or Indians or humans what is what does that better life for all of us look like hmm. good question uh what is a better life you know to um to go back to the point about top down and recently taking soon there was an interview of him i don't know whether you listened to him and he is a man over the last 50 years have been trying to to change the way we think, change the attitude. Uh, and he's very Malayan in, in, in his um, sensibility. And um, he was saying that he believed at first by talking to government leaders and going to the top, things can be changed. Now he's come down after 50 years of work, 56 years of work, he's decided no, you can't, you have to change from the bottom. You have to change communities. And I, I am not sure how we will get to a perfect society. You have to have freedom, but you also have to have understanding what that freedom means, you know? And um, you have to have values Certainly not a capitalist society, you know, where money, and that's our problem, where, I mean, I look at NTOC and the Labour Foundation and, uh, and they're supposed to say uh, to, to, to serve workers and yet look at what's happening, look at the state of our foreign workers. So if you stick to your value system, you will be more respectful, more tolerant, more generous towards workers, never mind where they come from, you know? And um, I actually am not sure. I'm happy where I am, doing what I can do, being interested in what's happening around me. I can only say that. And in my old age, I'm comfortable. And I, I, I think we have to have, when we go back to the beginning, we were democratic socialist. That's how we started out, you know? And it was very exciting. What is a democratic socialist uh, uh, country, you know, which practices democracy and socialism? It, it sees to every human person and um, it cannot solve all the problems, but it can solve. You can give a fundamental uh, security for living in your country, fundamental security, education for your children, a home, work, enough to feed your family and um, and the freedom, if you want to challenge the government, the freedom to challenge the government, freedom to stand for elections, you know, without being, uh, I mean, every time they, they threat, they bankrupt you, they mm. demonize you, uh, a country which, which uh, has, I am waffling, 
<laughs> no, there's there's so much there, so much there. You know, the the collected wisdom of of uh, over 80, 85 years of 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 life and yeah. 60 plus well, well uh, less than that i think but all the a whole career in civil society activism and you know it it, it actually there's a lot it, it boils down to a lot of very basic things freedom from need freedom from want um yeah. sorry freedom from want freedom from fear right anti-capitalism democratic socialism collective action from the bottom up I think the world is recognizing these are very, very important things. And I think, you know, that that's where we've got to go if we're going to create that better life. Yes, yeah, thank you. You put it a lot more succinctly than I did. I was, well, I was just summarizing what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, we're out of time, Connie. So thank you so much for coming thank on the show. So I really much. enjoyed, I, I always enjoy talking to you. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you so much. Um, so for all of you who are listening, the book is Where I Was, a memoir about forgetting and remembering. Yeah. Uh, it, it will be available for pre-order from ethosbooks.com.sg in early March. So go to ethosbooks.com.sg or go to uh, Facebook or Instagram at ethosbooks to order. And um, yeah, we've been talking to Connie, Connie Singham. So thank you very much for joining us, Connie. Uh, thank you for your time. And thank you, PJ, for having me. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, thank Connie. You. Thank, thank you to you, me. our listener. Uh, and thank you to all of you, as always, for tuning in. If you'd like to join New Narrative and support our movement for democracy in Southeast Asia, please go to newnarrative.com slash join. If you'd like to donate, please go to newnarrative.com slash donate. Thank you very much, and see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about New Narrative, please check out this playlist up here. And if you'd like to watch episodes of Political Agenda, please check out this playlist down here. Thank you very much and please help keep New Narrative sustainable and independent by joining as a member at newnarrative.com join. Thank you.